<clears throat> so parametric, the stuff that we're doing for parametric is pretty simple because you just have to be introduced to it this year. You don't have to go very deep into it. They just like for you to have seen it before. Mm -hmm. um, we do a little bit more with it in calculus, um, but even the stuff in calculus isn't very bad. So if you look at this, um, the use of parametric is to be able to, to look at maybe like the path of an object. And we've done that before. We used to do it with quadratics all the time. If you thought about like the there's like a cannonball that shoots out or something, or you have like somebody shot a basketball or just like something that's being launched where it like goes up in the air and comes down. And usually what they do in those parabola problems is they talk about like the height of the object um, over the amount of time that has passed since it's been shot out of the cannon or whatever. This type of equation allows you to talk not just about the height, this would be the equation that gives you like the height of the object, but you can also talk about like the horizontal distance of how far it's going. And so it allows you to compare those two different measurements together and then also say like at a certain time where that's happening. So that's typically the use of a parametric equation. It's basically like um, being able to write an equation that uses three variables instead of two, I guess but still be able to graph it in two dimensions, which is kind of cool. All right, so for this beginning part, all they're gonna ask you to do is take that T value that's at the end and plug it in and find the X coordinate and plug it in and find the Y coordinate. So you're gonna say when the time is T equals one second or one minute, this is what the X value is and this is what the Y value is. So I'm just gonna say X plugging a one in would be three minus five times one. And what would that give us? Yeah, negative two, perfect. And then y of one would be four plus two times one, six. And so we would say when the time is one, the location of the object is negative two, six. Okay, go ahead and try number two. I think these will be pretty easy for you guys. During lunch, I was watching um, a YouTube video on NFL referees getting taken out during the games. And that's pretty entertaining. It was a compilation. You guys should watch something like that because I was laughing. Um, there was like a couple times where they straight up just like, they were like running. I don't know what the names of all the guys are, but it's like the guy who is um, like knocking everyone out of the way so the person can run it, you know? And one, one of the big guys, he just like, he was running towards the ref and he's just like, boom! And he just like knocked him down like he was another player. He didn't even be like, oh, that's a ref, I should avoid him. He just like straight up knocked him down. Like intentionally knocked him down. It was incredible. He should, he should have moved. But maybe also if you're a big football dude, you should not run into the ref. Look straight into them. But it was like, did any of you guys ever play Donkey Kong? that video game oh there was a little like donkey kong when he ran into someone and like knocked them down that like boing, you know when it like he hit him with his big belly and then the thing went flying that's what it reminded me of anyway all right how was number two did we get it yeah it's pretty good all right let's look at number three so for number three we have to remember our unit circle a little bit so we have four plus two times cos of pi halves I guess I could be consistent with how I'm writing this. I would have said x plug in pi halves. You don't have to write that if you don't like it. All right, so I have to picture the unit circle. Pi halves is up here and that's where we have the point zero one. So if I was saying four plus two times cos of pi halves, what would I get? Cos of pi halves is zero. So that's two times zero, so that goes away. So what would I get? Four. And then y of pi halves 
would be three plus, and then this problem is kind of interesting because it like uses the x value. They don't always do that, that's pretty rare, but it's kind of cool. So here it says do three plus and then do five times the x value that you got. And so the x value that we got was four. And then we'll do sine of the t value. Okay. So what is sine of pi halves? One. So we have three plus five times four times one. So what should that be? Yeah, 24, or not 24, 20, 23. Okay, so our point is four for the x value, 23 for the y value. For number four, we're going to think about a unit circle again. Anyone remember what the x and the y coordinate are at 30 degrees or pi 6 if you need to think of it in radians? Anyone remember the x and the y coordinate right there? Yep. And then one half. I mean, you had it. All right, so go ahead and look at number four. This one, it's like the number in front of t is just really complicated, but then the, you plug in two for t. That's pretty easy. This is not a calculator question, by the way. You can do this one by hand, and the answer is pretty nice. So go ahead and try it. So what happens when you simplify the x? You can see that I could do something right here. Yeah, the times 2 and the divide by 2 cancel, right? And so what do we end up getting? Yeah, 60 root 3. It seemed all crazy, but it really was kind of nice. And then what about the y's? Yeah, 65. So the 1 half and the 2 cancel, and then you just have 5 plus 60, so 65. So our point here, we've got 60 root 3, 65. Okay, so next on the worksheet, it's going to have you guys um, graph parametric equations. And so we basically do what we just did in that first section um, where we have specific t values, we plug them in for x and y, and then we're able from that to plot a point. So here they gave us t values. They said use from negative two to positive two. And there is not a magic number for how many t values you have to use. If the interval is kind of small like that, I usually just go by ones. If you wanted your graph to be more accurate, you could go by halves. Um, do like negative two, negative one and a half, negative one. I don't feel like doing that many problems. So I'm just gonna do negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. And that will be enough for us to be able to graph it. And then x equals t plus two. So I'm gonna find that. And then y equals t squared. So I'm gonna find those two. So for the first part, I've got negative 2 plus 2 is 0. Ooh, that was awkward. Negative 1 plus 2, 0 plus 2, 1 plus 2. You guys are so good at counting. And then 2 plus 2. Marvelous. That was so fun. Let's do it again. So here we have negative 2 squared. 
four. That was almost awkward. We got it though. Negative one squared. Now, don't forget, um, don't forget to put your negative numbers in parentheses before you square them because if you don't do that, you kill baby tigers. And there were multiple baby tigers that died um, last class. So let's not kill anymore. So we always put parentheses around our negative numbers before we raise them to an exponent. And then we have zero squared, and then one squared, and then two squared. Four. I heard six, but I ignored it, and I just wrote four. <laughs> I liked it. It was a good joke. It was good. Anytime you make a math joke, I fully support that. Because it means that you are becoming a little bit more nerdy, which I, which I enjoy. It's, it's that moment. You guys know the little emoji that has the glasses and the teeth, you know? That is like my heart. So anytime somebody does anything that deserves that emoji, I just feel like real happy. All right. So we have the point zero. Now, now at this point, at this point, we ignore the T values. And we just plot the X and the Y coordinates. So we've got zero, four. And we've got one, one. And two zero, and three one, and four four. All right, and I'm going to go ahead and connect to that. I've got a little parabola. I am not putting arrows on either end because the instructions tell me that the domain of this graph, or like the numbers I get to plug in, are from negative two to two. It does not tell me to plug in the rest. So this is the entire graph. There's nothing else. That's it, okay? Now, the part of the instructions that tell you to indicate the orientation of the curve mean that you show which direction the curve was formed. So the first point was right here at 0, 4, and then the curve went this way. So I'm going to draw an arrow, and maybe another arrow, and maybe another one, just to say, like, yep, it went this way. Mm -hmm, still went that way. Yep, still went that way. Predictable. You know what I'm saying? All right, now a lot of people will leave their parametric equations like this when they graph them and call it good, but sometimes you'll see where they want to include the T value on the graph. And so if you include the T value, you would say this is where the T is negative two, this is where the T is negative one, this is where the T is zero, T is one, T is two. Um, I don't like to do that because now the graph looks terrible, but some people do. So in case you see that, that's what they're doing is they're showing you, they're including the T values on the graph, even though the graph is in two dimensions in terms of X and Y. It allows you to put that third variable in there. Okay, let's go ahead and think about the next one. We'll not really think about it, but just make sure we're good. So here they tell you to use T values from negative two to three. Um, that's not a very big interval, so I'd say just go by ones. Negative two, negative one, zero, one, two, three. I think it's pretty easy. All right, go ahead and flip the page. I want to show you guys some that have weird intervals. All right, so this is number seven on the next page. Here they tell you to graph all the t's that are greater than or equal to zero. So clearly we're going to plug in zero. Uh, should we try plugging in 50? Should we go all the way to 50? No, why not? It's too much because our graph isn't that big. So even though this says t is greater than or equal to zero, you don't really have to graph everything. You just graph what will fit. So what is the biggest t value that's going to make sense? 50 doesn't make sense. That's too big. 10 makes sense, right? 10 plus 1, that's 11. I mean, that's a little bit off the graph, but we could graph it. 9, I guess 9 makes more sense, all right? So even though even though this, um, this domain over here was kind of vague, it was still pretty easy to figure out, like, what numbers we should maybe plug in, like 0 to 9 or 0 to 10, something like that, because it'll actually fit on the graph. But now let's get a little bit lazier. I don't know about you guys, but I don't want to square root 3 and graph it. That's obnoxious, right? So I'm going to think of t values that um, start at 0 and maybe go to 10 or so, but ones that are easy to square root, okay? And that's going to help me figure out what numbers I want to plug in. So for my t, I'm for sure going to start at 0, 
because that's, you know, where the graph started. What's another number that's easy to square root? Four, but what's, what's between zero and four that's easy to square root? One, okay, so I'm gonna do one, and then I'll do four, and then I could do nine, and then that's all the t values we need because that's from like zero to 10-ish, which is about what would fit on our graph. Does that make sense how I'm kind of thinking about that? Okay, so let's go ahead and do this one because I wanna show you what happens when you have um, an interval like that. So we have x equals t plus one, and y equals square root of t. So zero plus zero, nope, zero plus one. Zero plus one is one. One plus one is? Four plus one is? Isn't this a fun game? Nine plus one is? Oh man, that was good. And then we have square root zero, and then square root one, and then square root four, and then square root nine. Okay. So when I graph this, I'm gonna start at the point one zero, and then I have two one, and then five two, and then 10 three. And when I draw this, I know that I shouldn't have had any t value smaller than zero. So on the left side of the graph, I am not gonna put an arrow, but on the right side of the graph, my graph technically would have kept going if my grid had been bigger. So I'm gonna put an arrow there to show that it would have kept going. And then I still want to put the arrows for the orientation. So I'm just gonna show that it went this way. And if you want to be fancy about it, you can go in and put your T values. T is zero, T is one, T is four, T is nine. If you don't wanna put those values because they make the graph look stupid, feel free to ignore them. I'm okay with that. All right. Let's look at number eight. The t value here says from zero to two pi. So this is basically saying like, what are the numbers on the unit circle that you could plug in? Again, we're not gonna plug in all of them. That's a lot, right? If you think about all the um, numbers that are on your unit circle, you have like pi six and then pi fourths and then pi thirds and then pi halves and then two pi thirds. And I just don't wanna plug all those in. So we're gonna think about which numbers on the unit circle we could plug in, but that are maybe a little bit easier to plug in. And so the ones that I'm going to use, and you can see I wrote you a little note. Do you see that little two there? I wrote, Miss Rice, what can I plug in? Oh, here it is. Miss Rice, what can I plug in? It's like you asked me that question. And then I answered, I probably use zero pi halves, pi, three pi halves, and two pi. Why would I use those ones? They're easy to plug in. It's just laziness, that's it. Isn't that nice? I support you being just a little bit lazy. All right, so zero, pi halves, pi, three pi halves, and two pi. That's what we're gonna plug in. This is a very giggly day. Okay, so if we start over here at zero on the unit circle, that's the point one zero. So for X, we would say, I'm not gonna write an X again. We would say four times cos of zero, and that would be four times one, which is four. And then we would do four times cos of pi over two. That's the point zero one. So four times cos of pi over two would be what? Zero, right? Because we'd have four times zero. And then we have four times cos of pi. That's over here. Negative four. Mm-hmm. And then we have four times cos of three pi over two, which is zero. 
and then 4 times cos of 2 pi, which is back to the beginning, that's 4. Okay, I want you guys to go ahead and do the exact same thing for the signs. So let's figure out what those answers are. Well, what would we have first? Zero, and then four, and then zero, and then negative four, and then zero. Okay. So if we graph these, we have the point four zero first, and then we have the point zero four. And when we connect this, we're gonna connect it this way. The reason I'm not drawing a straight line is because I know what this graph is supposed to look like. If you, and now you're going to know. So anytime you do one like this, you'll be like, oh, that's a circle. Um, if you didn't know what the graph was going to look like, you could have done more points in between here. So you could have done the point at pi six and then pi fourths and then pi thirds. And if you did that, you would have had like a point here and a point here and a point there. And it would have been very clear you were drawing a circle. So anytime you're doing one of these curves, if you feel like your points are so far apart, you don't really know what's going on, then you can just do more points. So pick more values of T and then you'll be able to figure it out. Uh, the next one is negative four zero. And then zero negative four. And then back to four zero again, so it finishes the circle. And then I'm gonna draw my arrows to show what the orientation is, that it went this way. And this is the only other type of question that would show up on the quest that would use like a unit circle, it would be something like this. All right. Um, when you look at number nine, this one for T, they don't give you any help. They just say use every single number possible for T. So now is when we really have to think about what's realistic to use for T. For example, should I use negative 100? No, way too big. Should I use negative 10? No, because negative 10 squared is 100. That's still too big of a number, right? Or too small, I guess. What negative number could we use that would make sense? Negative three would give us nine, right? Nine plus one. Would negative three make sense here? What would that give us? Negative three to the third is negative 27. So we're not gonna use a T value of negative three. It would work for the X, but for the Y, it would be too negative to be on our graph. So what X value, or what T value should we use? Negative two. So even though this says all real numbers, right? All the negatives, all the positives, negative two is the smallest number that makes sense. Anything smaller than that, we can't graph. Okay, so when I do my T values for this one, I'm gonna start with negative two. Okay, uh, what is the most positive value for T that would make sense? Probably positive two for the same reasoning, right? Positive three would be 27, that's too big. So we're gonna do for this one, negative two, negative one, zero, one, two. That's all we have to graph. Even though it said all real numbers, we're just going to use the numbers that make sense to graph it. Okay. All right. 
Um, for number 10, what does this notation mean? All real numbers. This says T is an element of all real numbers, which means that you can use any positive, any negative. So if you don't like that notation, you could just say negative infinity to infinity. That means we have to think about what T values would make sense. So are we going to use negative 10? No, because that would be negative 20 for the x coordinate, so we don't want to do that. What's a t value we could use? Negative 5 would work. Okay, so I'm going to say my smallest value for t could be negative 5. Does negative 5 still work for the y coordinate? Yes, okay. So I'll use negative 5. What is the most positive t value I should use? Positive 5 for the same reason, right? Um, now, negative 5 to positive 5, that's like a lot of numbers in between there, right? So if you want to go by 2s, you could go by 2s. Maybe you could do negative 4 to positive 4. If you want to keep the numbers even, that would be fine. Um, so you guys can pick which numbers you want to do, how far apart you want to go, um, just because on that one the interval is kind of big, okay? Does that make sense how I'm picking my t values even though they didn't give it to us? Okay. All right, so I'm going to let you guys work on that for a little bit, and then um, I will help you some more before we switch to the next page. Okay? All right. So in your calculator, you're going to hit the mode button. And right now it's in function, which is like your rectangular, your x and your y coordinates, like normal. Over here, we can go to parametric. The next one's polar. That's what we're doing next unit. So we change it into parametric, and then we hit y equals. And now, instead of it having a y equals equation, it says x and y because it's a parametric, so it's expecting you to have both. So if you look at number 9, because number 9 was like the weirdest one when you graphed it, if you start typing it in like you're typing your x and type x squared plus 1, it's actually going to put a t there for you. And then t to the third, nope, don't type it there. I'm going to make it wrong. Go down and do t to the third minus 1. So you've got them typed in. And then once you have that typed, go ahead and hit the window button. And now it's going to let you choose what t values you want to graph. So the t values that we're going to graph is we're going to do from negative 2 to positive 2. So my t min is negative 2. My t max is positive 2. When it asks for t step, it's asking how far apart your points are. So let's go ahead and do 1 so we can see what it looks like, which is what we did. We had a step of 1, right? And then for your x min and max, you can say negative 10 to 10 because that's what our graph has. And then for y, min, and max, you can do negative 10 to 10 because that's what our graph has. Okay? So go ahead and hit the graph button. No. Did it real fast. Boom, it was there. All right. Um, now, if you want the graph to look a little bit more accurate, you can change your t step to be a smaller number. So that would be the equivalent. Like, let's say if I change my window and I say my t step is 0.5. Ladies, are you ready? If I say that my t-step is 0.5, that would be kind of like when I did my table if I went by halves instead of going by whole numbers. So maybe I graph negative 2, negative 1 and a half, negative 1, negative half, 0, and I did it like that. You'll see that the curve looks a little bit better. If you change this and do like point, um, 0.005 maybe, it's going to take it longer to graph. But the curve is going to be getting more and more accurate each time you make a smaller t-step. Does that make sense? So it's kind of like saying I did the table, but I did my t-values um, much closer together, and so my graph looks more accurate. Okay. So anytime you want to graph any of these, you can always check them like that. Um, are these graphs typically functions? No. Like this, does it pass the vertical line test? Nope, that's not a function. Okay? And then like this one's a circle, that's definitely not a function. Okay? All right. Um, so I just wanted to show you that they, there's, you will not need to do that for me on a quest. 
tomorrow. You will not need to do that um, very likely for your NC final exam. I've, I would doubt they would have you do something like that. Okay, but I did want you guys to see how to do that um, just in case. Go ahead and hit second plus 712. We're going to clear the calculators just so that people don't get confused if they're in parametric after this. So second plus 712. Okay, and then you can go ahead and turn to the next page. So for this, they'll say um, convert the parametric into the rectangular form. And the way that you do that is you eliminate the parameter. So basically, you're going to figure out what t equals and you're going to substitute it into the problem so you can get rid of the t. Okay, so the first problem is pretty easy. Um, typically, we want to look at the x equation and use that equation to solve for t and get the t value all by itself. And so when I look at this one, I can see that t equals x, and that's about as simple as it is. And then once I have t all by itself, I can take this right here, and I can substitute it in for the t and the y equation. And once I substitute it in, then the t is gone. So I would say that this equation is 2 times x. And I would say that's my rectangular form. I eliminated the t, and I just have this. So if I were to make a table of values from these x's and y's, I would end up with a graph that looks like y equals 2x. Anyone know what type of graph that is? What kind of picture that would look like? Linear. Mm -hmm. So part of the instructions ask you to classify the graph, which means you're going to tell me what name it has or what it would look like. And then we want to find the domain of the graph. So we're just going to say, what are the x values that you're allowed to plug in? So if we look at this one, the t values you could plug into there to t and 2t, there's no reason to have any limit to that. You can always have a number by itself. You can always take 2 and multiply that by anything. There's no limitation there. And so I'm going to say that the domain for this linear graph would be negative infinity to infinity because there was nothing that would be any issue to plug in. All right, let's look at number 13. So again, I'm going to take the x equation and I'm going to try to get t all by itself. So I have x equals the square root of t. And then what could I do to get t alone? Yeah, square each side. So I get x squared equals t. And then this is what I'm going to take and substitute in for t in the other equation. So what should my rectangular equation be? x squared minus 1, right? Anyone recognize what kind of equation that is? Quadratic, yeah. You could call it a quadratic, or you could say it's a parabola. Both of those are okay. Now, for this one, our domain is going to be a little bit limited because they had a square root of t, and you can't just plug in anything you want for square root t, right? What are some values you can plug into that? Negative 5, can you plug in negative 5? No. Nope. Can you plug in 0? Yes. You can take a square root of 0. What happens if you square root 0? You get 0, right? So when we plug in numbers for t, we could get 0 for x. Um, we know we can't plug in negative values for t. Um, we can plug in positive values for t, right? And here it doesn't say get the negative version of the square root answer. It just says square root it. So we're going to get the positive version. So that means the only x values that you're going to get are going to be 0 at the very smallest and then positive numbers. There's no way to pick a t value that you could plug in that would give you a negative number for x. Does that make sense looking at it? So I'm going to say that the domain is from 0 to infinity because I can plug in 0 and I can plug in positive numbers, but negative numbers are just not going to happen. I can't plug them in for t, and no matter what I plug in for t, they are not going to happen for x. Okay. 
Um, I am not planning on testing you hard on domain at all. Domain might not even be on the quest. The reason I'm talking about it is because this is a much nicer day to discuss this than next year in calculus when we're learning other stuff also. Make sense? So I just want you guys to be able to think about it a little bit. Okay, we're also going to look at number 14, and then I'm going to let you guys um, try the rest of it for a little bit on your own. So number 14 has a little hint. What does the little hint say for number 14? What does it say? Yeah, so that takes you back to the trig unit, right? What is this called? What was the name for this? It starts with a P. Pythagorean identity, right? Okay, so anytime you're looking at a parametric equation and you see a sine and a cos, you are always going to use this equation. It's not something I would have expected you to find on your own, but now that you know the trick, you're going to use it every single time. Okay, so for number 14, we're going to do sine squared plus cos squared. For number 15, we're going to do sine squared plus cos squared. For number 16, we're going to do sine squared plus cos squared. For number 17, we're going to use it. Anytime we see those two options, we're going to use it. What are we going to use for number 18? Not the opposite. Look at the little hint. What does the hint say? Tan squared plus 1 equals secant squared, which was another one of the Pythagorean identities. Okay, so that's the trick to doing these problems. We're going to look and see how this works out, okay? So the formula that we're going to use is sine squared plus cos squared equals 1. And what this notation really means is it really means you're going to take whatever you have for sine and you're going to square it. You're going to multiply it by itself. And then you're going to take whatever you have for cos and you're going to multiply itself, and that is going to end up equaling 1. Okay, so this is a little different than the other problems. In the other problems, we wanted to get t all by itself. In this problem, we want to get sine t by itself. So it's a slightly different process. Okay, so over here, I know that x equals 2 sine t. So how do I get sine t alone? Divide by 2. Okay, so that means that x over 2 equals sine t. So over here I'm going to say this is x over 2 squared. And then I need to get the cos t all by itself. And so what am I going to do? Divide by 2. So that would be y over 2 squared. And then I have to think about what I would have gotten if I multiply the top by itself, if I square the top, and if I square the bottom. So if I square the top, I just get x squared. If I square the bottom, what do I get? 4. If I square the top, what do I get? If I square the bottom, what do I get? Okay. Anyone recognize what that is? It's one of the conics we learned about. It's a circle. It's a circle. Yeah. It would almost be an ellipse if the numbers were different, but they were the same. So it's a circle. So the other form for this is x squared plus y squared equals 4. So either of these answers is okay for the rectangular form, but this is a circle. So anytime you see a sine and a cos, that means you either drew a circle or you guys are right, it could be an ellipse, a circle or an ellipse, depending on the size of the numbers. This one happened to be a circle. Now for this one, for us to think of the domain, we have to picture what would happen if we graphed this circle. So what's the center of the circle right here? Zero, right? Zero, zero. And what's the radius of this circle? Two. So we would start at zero and we'd go right two and up two and left two and down two. 
So what are the x values that we can use for this circle? How far left, how far right? Negative 2 to 2. Okay. This is a very common parametric problem. I would not be surprised if this was on your NCFE. It will definitely be on the quest tomorrow. It's a very common problem, okay? So that's, that's just how you do it. Now, it doesn't matter if you have sine squared plus cos squared or if you want to do cos squared plus sine squared. So it doesn't matter which order you do them. Um, but it's going to end up being a circle each time, or it could be an ellipse. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. I'm going to give you guys some time to keep working on these. Um, the goal, so what second period, what our goal ended up being in second period is we wanted to get um, done all the way through number 22 as like homework. And then students um, could do 23 through 28 if they wanted to get extra credit. What I did with this assignment is... Um, I wanted you guys to have a good introduction to parametric equations, but the assignment goes a little bit deeper than it needs to. So if we don't do perfect on the entire assignment, that's fine. All right. As long as you can do questions like 1 through 14, you're good. The rest of them are going a little bit overkill, but that's okay. It's good practice. All right. So for this one, we're still going to use that sine squared plus cos squared equals 1 because the problem has a sine and a cos in it. All right, so if I want to get the sine alone, then I'm going to have to take this one and add it to the y, right? y plus 1 equals 2 sine t. And then what else am I going to have to do to get the sign all by itself? Divide by 2. Okay, so that means I have y plus 1 over 2. And if you're already like, ew, I don't like that that goes first because it's a y, it's fine if you want to switch the order of your parentheses. Since they're added, you can switch them and it doesn't make a difference. Okay. Um, and then over here, we want to find our cos t all by itself. So what would I do? So x minus 1 equals 3 cos t. And then divide by 3. And so we're going to say plus, And instead of cos, I'm going to write x minus 1 over 3 squared equals 1. So if I think about squaring the top and the bottom, are you guys okay with me switching it and writing the x first? Okay. So if I square the top and the bottom, that would give me x minus 1 squared on the top, and then on the bottom, that would give me 9. And then for the second one, what would I have? Over 4. And so this one is not a circle. What is this one? It's an ellipse. Okay, so this equation is done. This is an ellipse. And for me to figure out the domain of this one, I have to picture myself graphing this. So I have to think about, okay, if I went to the right one and down one, and then to graph that ellipse, what would I do? Yeah, I'd go left and right three, and then I'd go up and down two. So if I started at one and I went to the left three, what would that mean for my domain? Negative two. And if I started at one and went to the right three, four. So it's an ellipse. The domain is from negative two to four. All right, um, the part of it when they say that they're only graphing it from zero to pi, we can go ahead and graph this on our calculator so you can see what it's doing. Um, since it's only from zero to pi, that means that we have to change the mode of our calculator back into radians. So make sure your calculator's in radians. 
And then if we graph this, we have 1 plus 3 cos t for the, just kidding, I have to switch it back into parametric. Okay, so make sure you're in radians, but also make sure you're in parametric before we start typing it. Um, and then when we type it, I've got 1 plus 3 cos t and negative 1 plus 2 sine t. And then for my window, for my t minimum, I'm going to say 0. For my t maximum, I'm going to say pi. All right. Does it make sense what I've done so far? Okay. Um, and then I think I'll leave the t-step the way it is, the x-max and y-max, I think all those are good. So now I'm going to go ahead and graph it. So what, did, what happens with the ellipse when they said only from 0 to pi? Yeah, it didn't graph the whole thing, which makes sense, right? 0 to 2 pi would have graphed the whole thing. 0 to pi graphs half of it. Does it change our domain? For this time, it happened to not change it, okay? So for this time, we would say our domain is still okay. Um, if we switched what part they kept, like maybe instead of saying from 0 to pi, they said from pi halves to 3 pi halves, would that have changed the domain? That would have made it different, okay? Uh, am I going to put that on the quest tomorrow? No. But is it good to be able to see it? Yeah. It's good to kind of see that it, that it changes things, all right? So just be careful look out for something like that. All right, number 18 used that other Pythagorean identity. So let's go ahead and write down that one and make sure we can do this. So this one was tan squared plus 1 equals secant squared. So what they really mean by that notation is that whatever you have for tan gets to multiply by itself. And then whatever you have for secant also gets to multiply by itself. So what should I be replacing the tan with? Y. And that tan is already solved for, so we don't have to do a lot of work there. So we have y squared plus 1. And what do I replace the secant with? X. Anyone have any idea what this one is? It's a conic. I think I heard it. It's a hyperbola, yeah. You can take the y squared and you can minus it over to the other side. So we would have 1 equals x squared minus y squared. And it still looks a little bit weird, but this would really be x squared over 1 minus y squared over 1 equals 1, right? Now it looks like a hyperbola. So anytime you have a secant or a tan problem, that's a hyperbola. These ones are not as common, so you probably won't see that on your NCFE. Don't, do I still have a minute? Don't pack up yet, because this one, the domain is weird. So if we picture ourselves graphing this hyperbola, I would start with a center of zero, and I draw my box, right? I go left and right one, and I go up and down one, and that's how I draw my box. And then I draw my asymptotes. And if the x squared goes first, then which way do the curves go? Left and right. They go like this. So if you notice, we use all these x values over here, but we skip them in the middle. And then we use all the x values over here. So the domain for this one would be negative infinity to negative 1 and positive 1 to infinity. So for some of these ones that are kind of weird, you might have to sketch it to be able to figure out what the domain could possibly be. All right. <clears throat> 